All right, welcome back, everyone. I've just uh, started the recording for the second lecture. Um, so any thoughts, any questions about uh, uh, how believers relate to civic authorities, government? Any thoughts, any questions, any discussions on that? Uh, yes, Pastor. Uh, so, so, yeah, we, there's a lot of examples that's been given uh, in the notes, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the questions that uh, uh, Christians would have regarding submitting to the governing authorities. And uh, and also as examples that you've mentioned uh, in the past, uh, you know, there have been a lot of uh, dictators, like, like Nero was one of them. And uh, in the recent century was one of the persons that come to my mind at least is uh, Hitler um, and, and so uh, what are your thoughts on dictatorship such as uh, uh, Hitler and you know and other like say even China's imperial government uh, who killed a lot more people than the Holocaust uh, what what are your thoughts on those pastors? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, how do we respond? Like even to any other generation that asks us, because I think one of the most popular questions when it comes to uh, atheism or about God is, uh, if God is good, why is there evil? Why did he let Hitler do these things? And then when we add to that uh, Romans 13, 1, um, I, I think it just, makes it a little complex for me at least so mm, how, mm. how would you tackle it yeah uh, good very good uh, question and um, you know and then you know like you're saying when you put all of that alongside Romans 13 um, it makes it very difficult for us um, to you know how do you reconcile all these things right? so uh my my response would be that um you see while um while god has set up institutions uh people come into the institutions in <clears throat> various ways so we're talking about the institution of civil authority people who are in uh, government authority over over a, a land over a region over a nation uh, so people come into that so that that institution was set up by god for a good purpose which is so in in this case the uh, the institution of civil government was 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 designed by god like just as we say marriage was designed by god we can say that now uh, civil government was designed by god uh, to be a channel of his administration for the welfare of the people but that can be abused misused uh, uh, and uh, people can use it for wrong reasons uh, and wrong purposes so people come into the institution by various ways um, but they're elected or maybe they come into power by you know forcefully taking control of power or or you know somehow manipulating their way into that place or working whatever system was there into that place did god permit them there yes was that institution set up by god yes did god permit these people coming into that place yes but those people could uh, carry out wickedness you know as in the case of the dictators we have mentioned they carried out wickedness and that wickedness definitely is not god's purpose it's not god's will so they came into power through whatever means you know through working their way up and controlling people and getting people to back them up and so on and they came into that place of power but they carried out wickedness that is definitely not of god it's not approved by god uh, so the institution was an ordinance of god it's set up by god 
which is civil authority to take care of the welfare of the people. God permitted in the sense, uh, you know, he, he allowed this person or these people to come in. They did wrong. The wrong is not from God. And we do not condone it. We do not approve it. And uh, um, the, the question is, you know, why doesn't God stop such things from happening? Uh, well, that's because he's given us people in general uh, the the freedom to make our choices, the freedom to make our decisions, to you know, to do our thing. So, in that sense, he's not you know picking and choosing every leader there. Uh, but God permits him to come into power, into the institution that he set, and then carry out. Um, you know, in this case, they carry, they carry out wrong things. They do wrong things. Um, so that's how I would understand it. And uh, you know, so I'm able to recognize that the institution is set up by God. It was intended for good, but man does steps into that and does wrong things, and yet God doesn't stop it because. You know, God is not, we are not puppets in God's hands. We are not robots that God is pressing buttons upon. But in the midst of all of that, for the people who call on God, they can experience the hand of God. So we would have stories of people who called on God during those difficult times and experienced God's intervention. And God's protection and so on. And some died, uh, you know, through all of that, some endured hardships through all of that. Uh, but God empowers his people through that while there are leaders who are carrying out wickedness and doing evil things. So, if we were there, what should we do? How would we respond to a dictator? Well, we have to protect ourselves. We have to protect our lives. We have a right to do that. And uh, trust in God to see us through. Uh, we would not align ourselves to the wickedness that's being done. Instead, we would believe God for protection, and we would do our part to protect people who are being violated or uh, wronged. So that's how we would respond if we were there, you know, in that in that time, in that place. Um, that's what we would do, because if what is being done is wrong, it's wrong. And uh, we have to protect ourselves, trust in God to protect ourselves, as well as um, protect other people. Uh, and and stand up for what's right to do what's good, even when the leader is wrong or the leadership is wrong. So, so that's kind of my thinking, my thought process in 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 context like this. In case of Hitler or others who have been very evil, people who are in power who are very evil and wicked and doing you know terrible things. Does that uh, help, Roshan? In the, I was just yes, thinking. Pastor. I was just thinking loud, out aloud. You know, just thinking through. Sure. Um, yeah. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, if I may, just uh, one question. It may not be directly related to this Romans thirteen, but just for clarity's sake, uh, when I, in this verse in Isaiah it says. Uh, as a continuation of this verse, uh, that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Um, now, is it talking about God's uh, sovereignty over the current government, or is it talking about, uh, or is it like prophetic about God's millennium reign uh, to come? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would look at it as the second one, which is uh, when when Isaiah says, you know, the government will be on his shoulder. That means um, uh, it's Jesus sitting literally on the throne of David, uh, you know, so for example, in, in Psalm 89, he speaks very clearly saying that Jesus will sit um, on the throne of David. He will rule and reign uh, 
you know, and uh, uh, this is Psalm 89 verse 36, uh, and it will be established forever. So, you know, Jesus, Jesus is going to literally be king uh, uh, from Jerusalem and rule and have um, the government administered by his people. So my understanding of Isaiah's prophecy is that it will be literally that he will be king, he will govern, he will rule, uh, and righteousness will be established. Yeah, so that's the millennial reign. Yeah. Okay, Pastor, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, Romans 13. And so I, I think a very challenging uh, um, discussion would be, you know, what, and I'm just going to mention this, I'm not arriving at any conclusions, but a very challenging discussion or a very, I would say, a very interesting discussion would be, how does Romans 13 apply? Or how should the church apply Romans 13? Mm, uh, in say, and I'm thinking about the church in America or other Western countries where in, 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 the, you know, in the last two years, there's been this whole thing about, you know, um, and as I mentioned earlier about mask mandates and vaccinations and so on. And the church has actually been divided in, 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 in any kind of response towards these things. Uh, and uh, some are portraying the government as evil because of mandating masks and vaccinations. And some are, you know, the cooperating with the government. Then this is from the church, you know. So uh, what would be an interesting discussion is to say, okay, take Romans 13 and how would we apply it into a, a situation like this? Uh, you know, what would be the correct response of the church? Because we're all reading the same Bible. Uh, we're all reading the same passage, Romans 13. But why is the church divided like this uh, when we are responding to something that is by the government for the good of the citizens of the entire nation? Uh, and why is there so much of, you know, uh, fighting even if, even among God's people, you know, that's a, that's a discussion. And uh, anyway, so let's move forward in Romans 13. Um, let's read verses 9 to 40. We'll try to finish that and then try to finish Romans 14 as well today. Romans chapter 13, let's go from verse 9 to 14. Somebody could read that for us, please. Dave, would you like to read that for us, please? Romans 13, 9 to 14. Or maybe Siddharth, would you be able to read for us Romans 13, 9 to 14? Hmm. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, who can read for us Romans 13, 9 to 14? And, uh, uh, I Russian, go ahead. I don't know why uh, the others, yeah, maybe the connection. Sure. Um, Romans 13, 9 onwards. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment or all summed up, in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Yeah. So, um, Having instructed us, verses 13 to 
uh, verses 1 to 8, having instructed us to obey the government, uh, obey civic authorities, Paul then tells us, look, the key is to walk in love. Right? He says, look, uh, if you walk in love, you're going to do no harm to your neighbor. You're going to keep the law. And the law, of course, is referring to uh, the old, uh, old uh, the law of Moses. You're going to keep the law. You're not going to harm anybody. And uh, basically, um, you know, it's he, we're going to fulfill what he told us there in uh, Romans 13, 3. You know, uh, 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 do good, do what is good, do what is good. So he points to walking in love, ultimately. You know, even in the context of, um, or, you know, being a, be a respectful of uh, civic authorities. Um, and of course, you know, there's the, the background to Romans 12, which is um, how you treat one another in the in the body of Christ. Um, then you, how you treat the government. Ultimately, he's saying, okay, in, in all of this, and how we treat one another and how we, how we uh, relate to the government. On all of this, the summary is walk in love. Walk in love. So we use that same thing when we come into the uh, in relationship with in relating to the government. You know, love must be our uh, standard. We walk in love, and if you walk in love, we do no harm to our neighbor. Uh, we're going to do everything that's right before God. We're going to keep the law. Then, verses eleven to fourteen, he turns it back again to the personal life of the believer, the way we live as believers. He's saying, okay, you know what? Uh, we've got to be people who are awake and uh, we are uh, closer uh, than when we first believed. Um, we walk in righteousness. And I think verse 14 sums up what he's telling us essentially. You know, verse 14 is, is it's, he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a phrase that Paul uses often, right? You find him using that in Ephesians. Uh, you find him using that in Galatians and uh, also here in Romans. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and literally, we can try to imagine it like this, right? When you wear something on, then what people see is what you're wearing. They see what you're wearing. So in this case, we're not wearing a garment, we are wearing a person. Put on Jesus. Now, that phrase, put on Jesus, simply means, uh, so it's it's more than just putting on a garment. It's, it's saying, take on, take on everything about Jesus. Take on his ways of thinking, his way of speaking, uh, just take on everything about him. His, you know, if you want to say his mannerisms or his way of life, uh, so that the end result is when people see you, they should see Jesus. That's the point. So to put on Jesus means assimilate everything about Jesus. Let it become part of you, so that ultimately, when people see you, they see Jesus. And he says, put on Jesus and don't make any provision for the flesh. Don't give any uh, room for the flesh to uh, exercise its, itself. You know, a zero, zero room for the flesh. And, uh, you know, uh, this make no provision for the flesh is, is something to keep in mind all the time. When, uh, especially when you're going, when we're going about our day to day life. Uh, what I like to do is I like to think preemptively. That means you think ahead of time to make sure that in the plans you're making, the things you're doing, the flesh doesn't get any opportunity. Right? So you are preemptively eliminating any opportunity for the flesh. So make no provision for the flesh, right? So example, uh, let's say you are traveling alone 
on uh, you're going on a trip you're traveling alone uh, which means you are going to, you know, you're you're going to be at the airport alone. You're going to be on the flight by yourself. You're going to go to the hotel by yourself. Uh, you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, all these things are happening. Uh, uh, so you're, you're by yourself, which means uh, there's nobody else watching you. I mean, a believer watching you. So now you've got to think preemptively. You've got to be very careful that hey as i'm journeying alone i want to be careful that i don't let my guard down so that i don't do anything that is uh, displeasing to god uh, so for instance when you okay let's say you go to the hotel room you're by yourself what would a temptation be well uh, what if you i'm not against watching television you can watch news or watch a, a good clean movie on a television that's that's up to you that's that's not a problem but i'm just saying okay you have to think hey i'm alone i don't want to do anything here that would cause me to sin right okay i can turn on television or i can choose to keep it off or be very careful when i'm watching television i don't want to get caught into programs and things that are uh, unclean or unholy that are not holy uh, that are displeasing to God so you are thinking ahead you are making sure you don't give the flesh any opportunity uh, make no provision for the flesh you know that's just one scenario one example but like that in uh, in, 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 in in as we go about our everyday life we can have this 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 uh, two things to guide us Put on Jesus, put out the flesh. You put on Jesus, put out the flesh. That put out the flesh means make no provision. Don't give the flesh a chance. Make no provision for the flesh so that it should dictate our actions and then we end up fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Right? So what is Paul bringing us to? He says, in the light of what he's taught us in Romans 12 and Romans 13, loving each other, uh, respecting the government, all that, the key is you walk in love. And we are also in a time when we are closer to the return of the Lord. And so we have to live as people who are awake. And the key to living as people who are awake is put on Jesus, put out the flesh. Put on Jesus, that is, imbibe everything that is of him so that it's as it's like you and me wearing christ so that when people see us they see christ and put out the flesh meaning uh, don't give any opportunity to the flesh to express itself and uh, you know have any chance of fulfilling its desires so that's how we are supposed to live having taught us that in romans 14 um Paul turns attention back to how we relate to one another. So, so, so now he's talking all about Christian living. You know, how do we live as believers? So, in Romans fourteen is back to how we relate to one another, and there are two key points he highlights in Romans fourteen. One is don't judge another brother who is expressing his faith differently from you. Don't judge another, I say brother means don't judge another believer. Don't look down, don't condemn, don't accuse, don't judge another believer who is expressing their faith different from you. So don't judge. Second, it says, don't become a stumbling block. That means live in such a way that your expression of faith shouldn't cause somebody else to stumble in their faith. So don't judge somebody else who's expressing their faith differently from you. Second, make sure that your expression of faith doesn't cause somebody else to stumble in their faith. Okay, so that's the essence of Romans 14. And uh, and then he, he puts it in the context of certain things that were re relevant for them the first one he puts in the context of you know what days you observe and what food you eat 
that is don't judge somebody uh, in their in their observance of days and food the second one is in how i express my faith in the food that i eat uh, i should do it in a way that doesn't cause somebody else to stumble now today uh, observing days and food may not be a major issue it may not may not be i would say in many places in many cases that nobody cares about which day you observe and uh, food you eat but the truth or the principle that 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 paul has brought out here still applies there may be other situations where i need to apply the same truth in today's context okay so let's read romans 14 understand the principle and then think about context in which we can apply this the truth uh, in in our our world today right so we're going to read romans 14 uh, verses 1 to 13 romans 14 verse 1 to 13 this is the first point the first part could somebody read that passage for us please romans chapter 14 uh, 1 to 13 something Romans chapter 14, uh, verses 1 to 13. Okay, uh, 1 to 13. Receive one and one who is weak in faith, but not to disputes, of, disputes over uh, doubtful things. For one believes he may eat, at, eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let no one who eats despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats for god has received him who are you to judge another servant to him own master is he stands or falls indeed he will be made to stand for god is able to make him stand one person stands one day another one day above another Another stems every day alike. Let each be fully con convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to him and no one dies to himself for none of us lives to himself and none no one dies to himself for it will if we live we live to the lord and if we die we die to the lord therefore whether we live or die we are the lord's for to this end christ died and rose and lived again that he might be lord of both the dead and the living but why do you judge your brother or why do you so come contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account to himself to God. Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall, in our brother's way mm. yeah, thank you so like we mentioned in this first part of this chapter romans 14 1 to 13 paul is you know he's concerned about people who are weak in the faith that's verse one weak in the faith weak in the faith this would typically refer to somebody who is new to the faith Right? they've just come to know the lord uh, so they they not they still are not and they don't necessarily understand have the understanding um of uh, uh, as much spiritual truth as somebody who's been in the lord for a while they kind of weak in their faith uh, they're new to the faith right so uh, so he says you know you receive somebody who is like this that means you welcome them but you receive them, you welcome them, but 
I don't get into dispute or doubtful things. I don't go arguing with a new believer of, uh, you know, and, 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 and like I said, in those days, okay, which day, you know, it's about what you eat and what you observe, which day you observe and all those things. Maybe perhaps those were things very important in those days. Uh, today, uh, we can think of other things like, you know, what clothes you wear, or whether you wear jewelry, uh, of, you know, do you go to the movies and do you all kinds of other things, right? Uh, that that we could dispute over. And he calls them, uh, Paul writes, says, dispute over doubtful things. I mean, these things are, you know, it's not like there's a hard and fast rule about, uh, other than what the scriptures already tell us, you know, people are free to, you know, people of course wear different kinds of clothing and all of that. So don't start arguing with new believers about these kinds of things. So don't, so he says, receive somebody who's weak in faith, but don't get into disputes, arguments with them over doubtful things. And the two things he's talking about here, doubtful things are what you eat and the days you observe. So for them, that probably was very important. You know, like, okay, what do you eat? Do you eat meat? Do you not eat meat? Uh, what, you know, what, you know, uh, and uh, do you eat only, he, you know, somebody eats everything, somebody eats only vegetables. That's worse too. And then about days, you know, which day you observe and which day you worship God and so on. So what is the essence of what Paul is saying? He's saying, look, let every man be fully persuaded in their own minds. Yeah? That's verse five, end of verse five. You make up your own mind. You know, whether you want to eat meat or you want to eat only vegetables, uh, whether you, you know, you keep a certain day aside to as a, as a holy day or whether you treat all days the same. Uh, you be persuaded in your own minds. So that means there is no hard and fast rule from the New Testament for the New Testament believer on such things. You make up your own mind. But then, you having made up your own mind, there are two things that you should follow. One, don't judge somebody else. That's the summation of what he says there in verse 13. You know, uh, he repeats that in verse 10. Why do you judge another brother? And why do you show contempt for another brother? Why do you look down? Oh, that brother, you know, eats uh, meat. Or that person needs this, or, or they dress like this, or you know what, whatever. Why do you? Why are you judging that person? Why are you showing contempt as though you are, you know, um, you're more spiritual or more righteous? No. Right? So it was thirteen. He says, "So let us not judge one another anymore, because ultimately, he says, look, we are the Lord's." Whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord, and God Himself would judge us. And each one will give an account to the Lord. So you don't go around judging other people. Right? So, you know, we can think of today's context uh, where, uh, uh, and again, this, this can vary from different parts of the world, you know, what is, what is the big issue there? But maybe, let's say, you know, in, 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 uh, some of our traditional church context, uh, clothing is like a big issue. You know, what do you wear? You know, um, well, if a preacher wears, you know, if a pastor goes up on stage with jeans, wearing jeans, so people think, oh, he's backslidden, he's, you know, something's wrong with the pastor. You know, that's just perspective. That's just the way people may think. But he's saying, don't judge, you know, why are you judging? Uh, let each person be fully persuaded in, the, in their own minds. Or, you know, if you have a long hair or if you have tattoos or if you have piercing and things like that, gone, that's it. People will not look at you as uh, a, a preacher, you know, uh, it's gone. Uh, so I, those kinds of things, you know, in in our in our world, means I'm talking about here in traditional India and in traditional Indian context also. Uh, these are things that people dispute over. You know, they fight over. 
and uh, as he says, don't judge, let each one be fully persuaded in their own mind. Uh, each one is doing it unto the Lord, and it is the Lord is God, of, and He is judge of the living and the dead. He is Lord over everyone, and uh, you know, to the Lord He will stand, and the, the Lord makes Him stand. So that should be our perspective. Then He not only says, "Don't judge somebody how they express their faith." He also says there in verse 13, the second part, don't put a stumbling block to somebody else. That means make sure that how you express your faith doesn't become a hindrance to somebody who is weak in the faith. So let's read the rest of the passage. That is from verse 14 to 23. And here he's focusing on primarily on what we eat and drink. Uh, so verse 14 to 23, please, somebody could read that for us. Go ahead, Kiran, Prince, Aaron. I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but do him who consider anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one of the one for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in this thing is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but if it is evil for the man who eats with offense, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor to anything by which your brother stumbles or or if or is offended or is made weak. To you have faith, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned. If he eats because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from the faith is sin. Mm. All right. So, verse 14 to 23, I guess another important thing uh, in, in that time was about what you eat, uh, what you eat and drink. And, he, you know, he's specifically he's talking here about meat. This is in verse 21. You know, talking about eating meat. Mm, he's talking about drinking wine, uh, you know, so those kinds of things. You know, he says, okay, what about those things? The essence of what Paul is telling us is, look, uh, we are free. We are free to eat whatever we want, verse 14, you know. Uh, I'm convinced in Jesus that there's nothing clean or unclean of itself. It's, you eat what you want. When you're in Christ, you're free to eat what you want, right? It's your choice. You decide. But I want to be careful. I'm just paraphrasing what Paul is saying here. Uh, I want to be careful that I don't grieve my brother because of food, right? And uh, and uh, if what I'm doing is causing an offense to another one, that's verse twenty. Yeah, it is evil for the man who eats with an offense. That means he's eating, but he knows that what he's eating is actually offending a weak brother. So the context here again is a weak brother, like somebody who is weak in their faith and, uh, and they don't understand the liberty we have in Christ, the freedom we have in Christ. And um, by my eating meat or drinking wine in this case as paul mentions here or whatever you know the food may be if it is causing the weak brother to be offended 
Now, offended in what sense? Offended in the sense that he doesn't understand the freedom we have. And for him, it's like, you know, hey, this is not right. This is not right. And this shouldn't be happening. You know, he's a weak brother. He doesn't understand. But Paul says, if I'm eating and I know that my eating is causing an offense to him or to the other, to the brother, then, uh, and then again, verse 21, causes your brother to stumble or is offended or is made weak. Right. So uh, the context, as we said, is uh, a weak brother, somebody who's new to the faith. And this person who's new to the faith is going to be stumbling or is tripping up in his faith. Stumble means to trip up. So if my action of eating something or drinking something is going to offend this new brother, a brother who's new to the faith, cause him to trip up in his faith or is going to weaken his faith in Christ, that's the ultimate thing, is affecting his faith in the person of Jesus, then he says, look, I won't eat it. I'm not going to be um, uh, uh, I'm not going to eat or drink that. Because he says, uh, you know, uh, verse 16, my good, I mean, I'm free. I'm exercising my freedom in Christ. It's a good thing. The kingdom of God is not about what you eat and drink, righteousness, peace, and joy. So the, the bigger and important, more important things, which is righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit. So I have the freedom. But in the exercise of my freedom, in the exercise of my faith, in the expression of my faith, if my action is going to cause a new believer to either be offended or the, the faith in Christ is going to be offended, or they're going to be weakened in the faith in Christ, or they're going to trip up in the faith in Christ, then in that context, I won't eat or drink, you know, whatever is causing offense. And um, uh, and he says, and, and that's it. So um, that's how we position ourselves in, in, in the ex expression of our faith. And, but he says, you know, you be free in yourself. You don't judge or condemn. You don't, you're free. As far as you are concerned, you are free in what you eat and drink. So, you know, that's the conclusion was 22 and 23. You know, you be, if you don't condemn yourself and you're fine with it, you know, happy is the one who doesn't condemn himself. Um, and, uh, you know, you're eating in faith. You know that uh, you're free to eat this. You're eating in faith. So if there is a weak brother, and I know that the exercise of my faith, the exercise of my freedom here is going to cause me to stumble. In that situation, I won't eat. Okay. So Romans 14, what's he telling us? Like we said in the beginning, when we, have, we need to be sensitive to people, meaning in the sense, okay, here's a new believer in Christ. Uh, I don't want to judge him on what he eats or how what days he observes on. Okay, you know, let, he's growing up. Let him, you know, express his faith. Let him be fully convinced in his own mind and grow. Don't judge, don't hold any kind of contempt. Don't get into argument about weak things. Secondly, make sure that in the expression of your faith, you don't become a stumbling block or a offense to a new believer. In that context, you, we may choose to not eat. You know, you may go home and eat, do what you want. You're free. Your heart doesn't condemn you. But in order to prevent a new believer from being offended, in that, when I'm with that person, I won't eat. Is how we express our faith. So, the point is, don't judge, and be sensitive that. The expression of your faith doesn't cause somebody else to be offended or stumble or fall. So I'll just give some examples. This may be very silly, and you know, actually, it is. For example, uh, in some 
some scenarios, I'm talking about especially from the Indian, Indian church context, it is wrong, uh, not wrong, I mean, they just don't like it for you to, you know, if you're up on the pulpit or on the altar area, you shouldn't cross your legs when you sit. It's, it's considered disrespectful. Or you shouldn't chew gum. Or you, in some, you shouldn't wear shoes when you go up on the altar. Now, am I free to chew gum? Yeah, I mean, I don't condemn myself because I chew gum. Or am I free to cross my legs? Yeah, I cross my legs. I don't condemn myself because I cross my legs. Or do I wear shoes wherever I go? Yeah. But uh, when I go into that context and they, they, they are looking at it very differently, I don't want to cause an offense. Mm, I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, offend their faith in Christ. Okay, so if I have to sit on the, the altar when I'm invited to preach over there, if I sit for the altar you know, without crossing my legs, okay, it's okay for one hour, two hours, I'll do that. And yeah, normally I don't chew gum anyway. It's, uh, too, you know, it's a very bad thing. But, you know, okay, I won't go there and cause an offense uh, and just make sure I don't do that, you know. Uh, or uh, if they want us to make, want me to take my shoes off, I'll take my shoes off, you know. In that context, I'm just being respectful and I'm making sure I don't offend somebody else uh, in the ex expression of my faith. Yeah, just, just a simple thing. So like, the, uh, I guess the main message here is don't judge somebody else in how they express their faith and what they eat or in, in these things that are, you know, they're doubtful. They, it doesn't even really matter. And secondly, be sensitive that when you express your faith, it shouldn't offend somebody else. If you feel it's going to be offensive to them, when you're with them, you know, you refrain but you're free on your own. When you're elsewhere, you're free to exercise your faith and your heart is not condemning you. So that's Romans 14. It's a very short chapter, simple chapter, uh, but uh, it just uh, gives us uh, practical instruction how we live with each other, being sensitive and respectful of each other. Any thoughts, any questions on Romans 14? Yes, uh, Pastor, could you please uh, elaborate verse 17, uh, as in the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, that's understood. So uh, but the righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, so when we see, talk about the kingdom of God, uh, so these three things are also uh, a part of it. Is, is that right, Pastor? Yeah, yeah. So what he's saying is, uh, this is how we live out uh, and this is how, this is what the, the expression of the kingdom of God in, involves, is walking in righteousness, peace, and joy, which are produced in us by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to focus on. So, so what is the correct expression of God's kingdom in our midst as believers? Walking in righteousness, walking in peace, walking in joy, that come from the Holy Spirit. It's not about the eating and the drinking part. You know, each one will eat and drink what they are comfortable with, but that's not what des describes the kingdom of God. What describes an expression, what is a, an expression of the kingdom of God is, we are all, regardless of what we eat and drink, we are all walking in righteousness, in peace, and in joy, that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that's the expression of God's kingdom in our midst. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right, so next week, um, we would uh, work on chapter 15 and uh, 16. So I think in, uh, in a week or definitely, definitely in two weeks, we will be done with Romans going through it and uh, just do a quick review and then uh, work on the assessments as well. Okay, let's close in prayer, please. Anybody could just pray and dismiss us this morning. Prince, are you able to pray? Or Kiran, whoever can? 
or Roshan, I think your mic is uh, best. <laughs> sure. Okay, okay, go ahead. Father, we thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father, and, and your favor over us, Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity that, that you continue to give us to learn from your word, Lord. I pray mm -hmm. everything that we study, Lord, will bear fruit in our lives, Jesus. I pray that our hearts will be like the soil that uh, where the seeds fall and bears fruit, Father. Um, I thank you for what you are doing in us and you're going to do through us, Lord. I give you all the glory, honor, power, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy your break and have a good rest of the day. I'll see you all again soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.